Where do these results leave you as you look ahead to 2022? Do you expect to see continued benefits from sustained higher energy prices? Yeah, thanks for uh, having me, uh, Tom and Francine. It's good to be here. Uh, well, I think uh, if I look at, uh, at 2022, uh, I think we start a year with a lot of confidence on the back of what was, after all, a tough year, 21, but also a year where we made a tremendous amount of progress. Our portfolio performed so much better than it did before the pandemic. Uh, and indeed, with debt having been reduced by $23 billion in a single year, generating this year as much as $40 billion of free cash flow, a very modest step up anticipated in capital, we will have a lot of free cash flow to play with to continue to return to investors, which I think is going to be the priority for 2022. And Mr. Van Burden, we have a great chart actually looking at cash flow and you know, how Shell compares with some of their competitors. But how can you stick to these returns given the backdrop that we're seeing? It's higher inflation, capex still low, and oil production is falling. Yeah, so if you look at our, uh, our cash flows for, uh, for 2021, we did about $55 billion if you exclude working capital effects, which are, of course, transient. So 55 is the underlying number. Uh, that is at a, a, an elevated uh, oil price, of course. But the macro, even though it's much stronger than at the beginning of the year, uh, I think is not too incomparable to what we have seen before the pandemic. And you have to bear in mind, chemicals margins haven't been great yet. Uh, the refining margins have also been quite moderate. So much, much of the strength you are seeing is also just portfolio strength. It's not just the macro playing up. Uh, and indeed, we believe that with much lower break-even prices in our projects, uh, we can sustain mm -hmm. this portfolio at lower capital levels than we were talking about before the pandemic. So when we say stepping up our capital to 23 to $27 billion, we probably will be at the right. bottom end of that range. And I believe that this is going to be a stable and long-range position for us to, uh, to be in. So as I said, I look with a lot of confidence to the year ahead. Right. Mm. OK, and obviously you're trying to build out the renewables part of the business and investing in that is crucial uh, for Shell and the rest of the sector. And, and you've, you've talked about that. But is it, is it necessary? Is it an expectation of investors that as you invest in renewables, that free cash flow is necessarily going to come down? No, I don't think necessarily that is the case. Now, of course, we have a very small uh, renewables business at this point in time compared to the rest of the business. Mm -hmm. So we will mm -hmm. be going through a period of building up that business. So don't expect a lot of free cash flow contribution from, say, for instance, our power business, our hydrogen business, our biofuel business, because most of the cash, if not more than the cash that we produce, we will also be reinvesting and actually building that business. But it's not just investment, Tom, I would say. A lot of people look at uh, the capex we spend on this, but we spend actually more OPEX than capex on these uh, new business models. Altogether, right. we spend about $55 billion a year, and of that, about a third we invest in the energy transition. And we want to step that up to roughly half by the middle of this decade. And I think in the long run, what you will find that the returns that we aim to get out of this business are very competitive returns that actually, certainly if you right. risk adjust them, but are very favorably compared with the rest. Mr. Van Burden, I mean, you have been criticizing this, you know, in the past because you spent too little on renewables. When are you expecting CapEx for renewables to actually outgrow the rest of the business? Well, we, uh, we have been spending about 2 to $3 billion on renewables. But then again, you have to bear in mind, Francine, if you look at the energy transition, it's not just what we put into wind parks. It's also what we put into biofuels, also we put into hydrogen. It's also what we put into electric charging. And if you just look at the operating costs which we spend on these uh, aspects of our business, it is actually altogether about a third. Now, if you then look right. at when do we do more than half, <coughs> I would say by 2025. Uh, by 2025, we want to be evenly balanced and spend mm. at least 50% of our total resources okay. on the energy transition. OK, you talked about the challenges of 2021, and one of them clearly was the activist investor Dan Loeb and Third Point. What have you been talking to that team about? How have you been trying to convince them of their case? They, of course, want to see a split up of the business, a division of the business. What are your conversations like at this point with Third Point and Dan Loeb? 
Well, I think congratulations would be in order. I think Dan Loeb has been a smart investor. He stepped into our stock at the right moment, and I'm sure he is enjoying the returns that we will have seen so far. Uh, but on top of that, we talked to all our investors, including Third Point. Uh, there's always uh, new ideas that we pick up, and we incorporate these ideas in the evolving strategy that we have. Uh, I think at this point in time, uh, also the strength of the integrated model is very much in evidence. But at the same time, we also realize that we need to accelerate the pivot out of our traditional business into the business of the future. And there are many Mr. ideas out there from investors on what we need to do. H have any other major shareholders also asked you to split up? <clears throat> Uh, no, I think at this point in time, I think the, uh, there is a, uh, always a range of views out there, uh, but I can't say that we are faced with a uh, sort of a broad call from shareholders on that matter. Uh, there are different views from different shareholders all the time, Francine, and, and our task is to, to incorporate these ideas uh, into a, a, um, a coherent strategy, and that is, I believe, what we have been doing also over the last year. Hmm. OK, can we get your views on the geopolitical story at the moment? Russia, Ukraine, if there is an invasion, we're not there yet, but if there is one, would you expect a sharp spike in gas prices? How would the industry navigate that? And are your JVs in Russia exposed to sanctions? Uh, well, Tom, I think it is indeed a, a very important story at the moment. And to be perfectly honest, we are watching it with as much interest as everybody else. Uh, we have no special insight in it, of course. We have some special interests uh, that you refer to that are uh, sort of contributing to our, uh, to our curiosity and, and preparedness for it all. Let me offer a few observations, though, is that, first of all, uh, if you look at uh, the supplies from Russia, under many difficult geopolitical uh, conditions, these have never been disrupted. Uh, so that's, I think, one point to bear in mind. The other point uh, to bear in mind is that if they are going to be disrupted this time around, I think it is more likely they will be disrupted uh, by way of sanctions rather than by way of unilateral action. We have to be ready for that, of course, uh, also in terms of what it means for energy provision to Europe. And we are. We, uh, we make sure that our facilities in Europe run very well. And if need be, we will be, of course, also supplying more liquefied natural gas in Europe, as we have been doing right. over the last winter. Uh, what it would mean for our operations in Russia, I think, would be speculative. So I would just like to refrain from commenting on this at this point in time. Uh, talk to us a little bit about your trading units. Did oil actually register a loss? And how did gas trading do? I think uh, trading is always, of course, a, um, um, a range of different outcomes. I th it's fair to say that oil trading didn't have its strongest quarter in Q4. Uh, that is often the case, of course. Uh, what we have seen is, is um, extraordinary volatility uh, in the gas markets. Uh, actually, volatility beyond what we think is, is useful and helpful also from a trading perspective. Uh, but with that, of course, we have been able to position the business as much as possible uh, to, take, uh, to take here and there opportunities that, that have been offered. So, yes, our gas right. trading business internationally has been doing well.